Good afternoon and welcome back everybody to another edition of the B&H virtual event space. Very happy to welcome back to the event space, Mr. Nate Luby. Nate, how are you today? I am so good. Thank you for having me on today. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, for those of you who don't know, today is March 3rd, 2022, uh, of course, should probably say that because otherwise, you know, you might, you might think we're in the future, but <laughs> uh and, and, and that means today's World Wildlife Day. So we're talking about wildlife with Nate. He's going to be talking about how he got the shot, uh, World Wildlife Day edition. So some stories from out in the field with Nate. I uh, want to give a huge thanks to our sponsors for the event, Sony. And I want to remind everybody who is joining us here, first and foremost, welcome. But please get some questions in, comments, whatever they may be. Nate loves to have a good conversation. So he's expecting a ton of questions and just even comments in general. So if you're joining us here on YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, go ahead, drop something in the comment section and we'll make sure to get it over to Nate. If you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature and that's how we'll get those questions or comments over to Nate as well. But Nate, thanks again for being here. I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you because you're gonna do a way better job than I will, but uh, I'll see you in a little bit. All right, yeah, thank you so much for having me on today. Um, as mentioned, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Uh, every time I share wildlife photos, I end up getting a bunch of questions. And I, I like that. I kind of like that conversational nature of things. Uh, B&H originally asked me to share like my five favorite wildlife photos and sort of the journey of how I captured those and what it took to get that shot. And as I was picking out my five favorites, which first of all, impossible to do <laughs> in the first place, uh, I realized that each photo sort of has a journey associated with it and several photos that lead up to that photo and maybe resulted from that photo. So uh, I'm going to break the rules and probably share like 30 photos today, but it'll be more of kind of an exploration of my journey into wildlife photography, which very much was sort of an accident, actually. And, uh, you know, along that way, I'm going to be talking about my process how I ended up there, things I was focusing on when I got that shot. And again, if any of that sparks a question in you, please don't hesitate to ask because uh, I'll probably say something a little bit confusing at some point. Uh, so to get started, my first photo uh, is a standalone. So let me share my screen so everybody here can see it. This is the one. Uh, and it's fun because nowadays, hold on, I got to move the... Uh, the old zoom bar so I can see my own screen. So nowadays I don't necessarily feel like I love this photo from a technical photography standpoint, but the reason it makes my list is because it was probably the first wildlife photo I ever took when I started my photography journey. And for that reason, it will forever be sentimental to me. This is a great example, I guess, of the right place at the right time, like purely happenstance. I was just out on a hike. I bought my first ever camera. It was a tiny little micro four thirds mirrorless. Um, I was just kind of on a hike with a friend in the afternoon in Rocky Mountain National Park. And I brought my camera because it was a hobby that I really, really enjoyed. And it was something that, uh, you know, I just figured, well, Rocky Mountain National Park, I'm definitely gonna get some photos. And this big bull elk just walked right in front of us, plopped down on this ridge and I fired off this shot. And at the time it was just kind of like, wow, Neato, click. I didn't really put any thought into it. And in retrospect, it actually came out pretty nice. But this ended up sort of spurring my love of wildlife photography. At the time, I was sort of a landscape photographer. I went here to take photos of these mountains. We hiked out and we we're going to spend the night, or not spend the night, sorry, stay out for sunset. So I came prepared for, for that. I had a tripod. I was going to try and get beautiful sunset clouds. And the best photo of the day ended up being several hours before sunset of an elk. Uh, and it, it just kind of made this, this really impactful statement on me that enjoying these landscapes isn't just about enjoying the landscapes, it's about enjoying the animals and the creatures that live in these locations. And that actually like sucked me in even further. It took me from being a landscape photographer to being a nature photographer, if that delineation makes any sense. Uh, and again, I wasn't actually really a photographer. I was just a dude with a camera at the time, but this inspired me to take it further. And uh, I ended up selling a print of this. It was the first photo I ever sold 
was this one right here, which is part of why it makes my list as a favorite because it also awoken me that uh, I didn't have to work my very low pay nine to six job, uh, you know, struggling to make ends meet. I could actually, and inside, which is the worst part, I could actually go outside, go hiking, earn a little money that way, even if it was in my free time on weekends. And I started realizing what I liked about this photo, and this is going to become a recurring theme in this presentation. It's not, uh, you know, just that there's an animal in there. You see a lot of wildlife photography is like, uh, I call them like glamour shots. It's like a sexy portrait of the animal, right? When you're just really close up on the face, focused on the eyes. And those are beautiful. You'll see, I have photos like that and I love them. But one of the things I like most about this is that it's sort of an environmental portrait, right? It shows the elk, but it shows more than that. You know, the elk is just kind of hanging out. Where's he going to go? He doesn't have a house. Uh, it shows the mountains behind him. It shows the clouds and it kind of tells the story of this elk and, and where he lives. And, you know, again, I was kind of getting started, so it's maybe not like the most impactful storytelling image, but that set me down that path of not trying to just capture those glorious headshot images, uh, trying to sort of showcase the animal itself. Uh, and that leads me into my second image here, which was several years later, I'd sold this uh, small little point and shoot camera. I had bought my first Sony. It was the Sony a7 II. And I'd actually at that point joined the Alpha Collective. And I'd done a tiny amount of wildlife photography up until that point, but nothing really substantial. And then Sony invited me to go to Alaska. Uh, I believe this was 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. And we flew up, they took me into Lake Clark National Park and uh, ended up getting this photo, which is by far, to this day, one of my favorite photos I've ever captured. Um, not just like one of the first wildlife photos I'm truly proud of, but one that ended up like fully pivoting my career more down this path. Uh, I ended up selling my first book cover of this image. Uh, and uh, later on, ended up getting some magazine covers, etc. cetera. The, the bear itself actually is in my logo now. So this image very much pivotal. And it's kind of fun, like going back and forth between these two photos and seeing the progression of my, my skills and my techniques, because it's sort of the same thing, right? A, a centered animal showcasing the landscape, but like much more, uh, but more storytelling, right? You can tell it's fall. You can tell uh, there's kind of a storm coming through. You can tell this bear is not interested in me whatsoever, which I think is kind of fun. And, and I really like this as another example of those, those environmental portraits I was talking about, because this showcases how rugged this landscape is, right? Like think about being this bear, uh, what you and I would consider to be an exhausting long hike. That's just where this bear lives, right? Imagine climbing up and over this mountain. That's what this bear has to do to get to a different lake if there's no fish in this one at the time. It's, uh, it's unbelievable how rugged the terrain is and just how truly hardcore the animals are that survive outside in these landscapes forever, more or less. And this photo ended up sort of changing my perspective on how I wanted to showcase that. And we also got really, really lucky because fall in Alaska is about three days long. And so it was really cool to be there for those three days, which is really just like a, a stroke of luck. But I, I do think it lends a little bit of depth to the image. And, you know, like I said, I'm going to talk about more photos than just the five favorites. So I want to mention while we were there, of course, I did shoot some of those like headshots. And, and this is a photo that I do really like, but I think it's a great example of like not telling as much story. This bear is in the water and you can tell that it stinks because there's flies around it. That's kind of it. Ooh, I clicked, clicked out of it. Sorry. Uh, and that's kind of it. You know, you can tell the bear smells sort of weird. It's maybe early morning and it's in the water. It doesn't tell that much of a story. You can't really infer a whole lot of personality about this bear. It's kind of a good image to see that bears have cute ears and that's about it. Whereas an image like this, to me, is much more impactful, has a little more depth to it. And most importantly, uh, this image, I guess I should mention also, shot with the 24 to 70 G Master, which uh, is kind of interesting to mention also. When everyone thinks about wildlife photography, 
they're always thinking, oh, you have to get a 400 millimeter F2.8 or the 600 millimeter F4. You don't need a $20,000 camera setup to take good wildlife photos. This was the A7 II and the 24 to 70. Uh, by most standards, people would call it almost a beginner setup nowadays. Uh, at the time, you know, the A7 II, I think, was as far as that system had gone. So it was a little more top of the line. But uh, it's fun to remind yourself that sometimes just having a camera and putting yourself in the right location is all it takes to get good wildlife photos. And this bear walked along the shore and walked a little further and it led to this image. And uh, I bring this up because... This was the shot that I loved. This was the shot that got me excited about wildlife photography and bears in Alaska. And this one ended up actually on the cover of National Parks Magazine uh, at the end of last year. And so it kind of shows also to me, fire a bunch of extra shots because you as an artist, or I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't put that evil on all of you, me as an artist, I guess I don't really know what is my best photo. Uh, I loved the other one so much more. This one clearly had a lot more legs. It ended up, uh, it's gotten around the internet a hundred times and, and far outperformed the others. Uh, question on those, Nate. Uh, yeah. If, if you, if you kind of go back and forth between your, your first image that you, you showed, and then, you know, you've got that kind of closer up picture of, of the, the bear in the water. And then you've got that image that wound up on the actual magazine of the national parks. You've got three kind of differing views, field of views, if you want, and, and how you capture that is, is there, I know, you know, when it comes to portraiture of people and things like that, there's definitely, you know, standards and rules that people like to, to say are what should be held to is, does that ring the same when it comes to shooting animals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, you know, all the like never shoot with a wide angle lens because it'll make someone's nose look big does apply to animals. But also if you're taking a portrait of a bear at 24 millimeters, no one's probably ever going to see that photo because that bear is going to eat you. So <laughs> there's, you know, some of that doesn't really matter, like the nifty 50. So you get the right amount of compression isn't quite as relevant because in general, I mean, like I said, this was 70 millimeters uh, and the bear is very small. That's probably about as close as I want to be to that bear. And this is a 400 millimeter. I do like to think about trying to capture faces. And I, I don't have any photos pulled up here that don't show that. But one of the like number one things that I made as a mistake when I was first getting into wildlife photography and something I see a lot of people do is capturing just seeing an animal and taking a photo of it. And you end up getting their butt facing away from you or uh, for an example, like an elk, their head is down and they're eating and it's not super interesting, so to speak. It's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't showcase the animal. You just kind of see that an animal exists. I'm trying to capture the face and the personality and the environment that they're in. So in that regards, for a photo like this one, I would say that, you know, you kind of approach it from the same approach that you would take for a, a human portrait, right? You want their face, you want their head up, either looking at the camera or maybe off to the side a tiny bit like this bear's doing. I think if you replaced this bear with a person, it would still be kind of a cool photo. And that's a, definitely a good way to approach it. Sweet. Uh, yeah. This photo, part of the reason why I didn't like it initially is because the bear is facing away from me. It's walking. Uh, I mean, it's facing into the frame, which is another big thing that I do like. I like all my animals to face in the frame, but it's facing away from me. You're getting more butt and more, you know, shoulder than you are face. And that was part of why I initially ignored it. Uh, but it turns out that it kind of still, it's less about the bear, it's more about the landscapes and just saying that bears exist in this location. Did that, do you think mostly cover it? I think, I think, I think you nailed it. Just uh, as, as a precursor though, don't, don't try to direct the bear, right? Don't, don't give it instructions how to pose. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, that's a great, that's a great thing to add, actually. Don't ever interact with the animals uh, and not just bears, but uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, they live here. These are wild animals. So any human interaction is detrimental to them. Even if it's uh, a moose walking through the woods, if you I've seen this, I'm not just making up an example. People will whistle and, and snap at the moose to try and get them to look at it. It's not only unethical to 
interfere with these animals because they don't think like, oh, he's taking a photo. I should look at this person. They will see you as a threat. They'll either get scared or they'll get defensive and they'll come to hurt you. And both of those are bad options because I don't want any people to get hurt while trying to take photos. And I definitely don't want these animals to feel threatened in their own native habitat. So please don't ever interact with the animals you're photographing. And definitely for the love of God, do not bait them. Don't put food out so that an owl will swoop in front of your camera. Uh, it's extremely unethical. And it's also just, it's hazardous to them. They always say that a fed bear is a dead bear because it'll learn that people means food. It'll wander into houses. And then eventually that bear will get euthanized. So yeah, please don't ever interact with your animals in any way. Uh, they're not models. Uh, also worth mentioning that moose kill the most people of any animal in North America. So just because something's not a bear does not mean that you are safe getting close to it. Um, okay, you. moving on from that very dismal lecture about animals killing you in the wild shouldn't ever happen if you're if you're careful about things um my love of bears uh was cemented on this trip i you know i've always loved bears they've always been my favorite animal but this seeing them up close in the wild we watched these bears catch fish right in front of us it was maybe like my single favorite day of photography i've ever had both from a wildlife and a landscape perspective and I, I started thinking about wanting to see more bears and what was the bear I wanted to photograph most. And I think for everybody who likes bears, uh, the answer obviously is polar bears. That's the coolest bear. I'm not taking questions on that statement. That's just a fact. If you disagree, it's okay that you're wrong. <laughs> uh, so I started planning a trip to head up north to see the coolest bear to ever exist, the polar bear. Uh, and this became a little bit more of a challenge for me because like I said, I like to try and showcase animals in their natural habitat. I'd like to showcase the environment they live in. This was up uh, outside of Churchill, Manitoba, which is without a doubt the single flattest place I've ever seen in my entire life. And I want to add a caveat to that statement that my dad's side of the family is from Nebraska. So I have some pretty substantial experience with very flat places. This is the flattest place I have ever seen. So showcasing the animal in its environment was a difficult challenge. And I ended up finding uh, a way to do that, which I, I am really happy with this photo. And I don't know if it's my favorite polar bear photo I've ever gotten, but from this trip, it really was. Uh, it's, this is the ocean he's walking on, which I think is cool. Those are frozen waves. The, uh, the ocean will freeze. I guess real quick, can you guys see my mouse when I'm pointing like this or you just see the photo? Um, we, we see it a little bit, yeah. Okay, cool. So I, just if I'm indicating different parts of the photo, that's good to know. So like each of these layers of the ice is the tide coming in, freezing, and then going back out. And you end up with these frozen blocks of ocean that go up and down and get thicker every single day as it freezes. And I was watching this process happen. There's a bunch of big rocks. So like these... Uh, chunks behind the bear and then a couple in front are like big boulders uh, that the ocean will freeze on top of. And then as the tide goes out, they kind of shatter around those rocks and give this cool texture. And I realized that maybe this landscape's not as flat as I thought. And these bears have this really fun habit of meandering through the ice field, kind of navigating. They'll alternate between going in the low spots to hide from their prey to hopefully surprise them and then going up on the high spots to try and see their prey so they can go find something. And this is right on the coast. There isn't really any prey. These bears are just sort of getting ready for winter. This was in early November. The ocean was just starting to freeze. So these bears that haven't eaten in three months are getting ready to head out to sea and finally start eating again, where they'll feast all winter before they start fasting again during the summer. So that, that activity was what I was trying to capture when I went up there it was these hungry bears newly out of their like summertime walking hibernation, they call it. Uh, and yeah, so this is another good example of, I like the bear facing me. He, he's not staring right into me. Um, his chest is open towards me because his far foot is taking the step. And there's some motion involved. He's not just standing. It's not just like another glamour shot, headshot of the animal. It showcases what he's doing, where he is, 
it tells you a little bit more of a story and it really lets you know that this place is extremely cold and this dude is in charge. But on this trip, I ended up taking a different photo that ended up being more impactful to me. This was the photo I went there to take and I was really glad I got it. But we ended up seeing this bear named Old Pete. And Old Pete is sort of a legendary bear. So I was at this very remote lodge, maybe a hundred miles outside of the nearest town. We had to fly in on a bush plane. It doesn't have wheels. It just has skis on it. Um, land on basically a frozen strip of tundra. This bear has sort of hung around this lodge. And he is, I would say, I think they said like five or six years past the life expectancy for a polar bear. So if you think he looks sort of decrepit, um, I've had people misattribute this photo as a, a climate change warning, and we're not going to get into that necessarily, but the reason he looks so run down is this is like looking at a 105 year old human. He's just very old. And this, uh, this sort of made me realize that I was approaching some stuff from the wrong angle. This is one of those like kind of bare headshots, right? This is an animal glamour portrait. And I realized that there are ways to tell that story in, um, in the Arctic specifically, because these animals live such dismal lives, right? It's dark for half the year, and then the sun doesn't set for the other half of the year. It'll be 50 below and snowing. They don't have anywhere to hide because it's just frozen ice. And this bear lived up there for, I think they said he was like 25 or 26 years old hunting. I mean, he lost his ear in a fight with another bear. His face is covered in scars. Uh, and this, this just ended up being such an impactful encounter. And this photo ended up being taken within the last week of his life. He passed away just a few days after I shot this. And it, again, sort of pivoted my career. It pivoted my approach to these animals and realizing that you don't have to just take a wide out photo to be impactful in your photography. You can take a close up image and tell a story. And this sort of pushed me to re-examine how I looked at these animals. And uh, we were blessed the next day, this beautiful young female who wasn't quite up to hunting capabilities. Uh, the ocean wasn't frozen. She was foraging in a, in a bush near us looking for frozen lingonberries to just, I think she was just kind of killing boredom. The, the caloric requirements of a polar bear are so high. There's no way that just eating those berries was going to help her out, but she was doing it for fun. And I ended up taking these shots, which are far and away my, my favorite images. I have, I have this one on my business cards, for example. And it really, it tells a story about their personality, right? You can see the falling snow. You can see that her, her muzzle is coated in snow from pushing around in the bushes, trying to get some snacks. And I mean, just how happy does she look, right? Uh, and again, sort of realizing that these up-close portraits can tell more of a story than I originally thought. And I think I was just trying to go against the grain with these environmental portraits and realizing that these sexy headshots can really convey a strong image and a strong sense of location and personality of these animals. Now, Nate, if I can interrupt real quick and ask, we, we've got a question here from Please. Christopher who uh, wants to know approximately how far were you away from, I'm assuming, old Pete, um, and uh, what was the focal length of the lens that you used? I'll, I'll just add in on that because I wanted to piggyback on that too, and I was going to ask this anyway, but um, you know, what, what do you typically go to for your aperture setting when you're, when you're shooting bears? Yeah, that's a great question. So old Pete uh, was taken with the 400 millimeter. Um, and this, I would say for 400 millimeters is too close to a polar bear. Uh, but we were in a compound that has a, a fence. It was not quite a chain link fence. The slats are a little farther open than that. And so I was actually shooting through that fence when I took this photo. So the aperture question, I shot this at F2.8. I was using the Sony 400 millimeter G Master. And uh, I put my lens very close to the fence at f2.8. So the lens is completely invisible and it looks like we're basically, you know, on the ground next to this bear. The only reason I was comfortable doing that is because of that fence. Uh, 
you never want to lay down near a polar bear specifically. Their number one food source are seals who do nothing but lay down and swim. So if you lay down on the ground, you will be a seal. <laughs> uh, but the fence is the reason I was able to do that. This one I had the teleconverter on. So this was taken at 800 millimeters. And uh, I think I stopped down to maybe like F7 on this one, um, mostly because the teleconverter is not super sharp. I don't know if I'm allowed to like say that I don't love the teleconverters on a Sony sponsored <laughs> event space, but um, we won't, we won't tell. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I try to avoid using them. They just, I think partially because the 400 G master is just so spectacular, putting anything on there that isn't just the lens itself is going to feel a little disappointing. Uh, and then these again were the 400 millimeter G master again through that fence, which is, is kind of interesting. I didn't shoot everything through that fence for what it's worth, but um we had such good luck with the bears being near the compound that there was kind of no reason to like really put yourself in unnecessary risk if they're going to just wander right next to where you're camped. Um, I see there's some more questions. Do we want to field a few more of those or should I keep cruising? Yeah, we can, we can, we can field them now. I guess, I guess, you know, we were talking about the, the, the 400 and uh, you know, we, we said it before, you know, gear is always something we like to talk about. And so we always get a ton of gear questions. Dan on Vimeo wanted to know, um, he's got a travel agency that uh, does African safaris. He's looking for a lightweight, long lens. Do you have any recommendations in terms of that? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's always going to be trade-offs. I would say the 400 or the 600 are going to be your best lenses. Photographically speaking, they're definitely not your best lenses weight wise. Um, but, you know, I, if I'm on assignment, I am going to take the lens that gets me the best photos, but that's because I'm a full-time photographer and taking the best quality photo is how I afford rent and food. So I would rather carry another five or six pounds versus make a sacrifice. But if you're, if you're really trying to like save yourself some weight, I love the 100 to 400 G master. Um, I haven't used the 200 to 600 a ton, but, uh, a lot of people love that lens as well. So those are both great options. Um, the 100 to 400 with the 1.4 teleconverter will get you close. It gets you, I think, gosh, math is not my strongest suit, but I think that gets you about 560 millimeters, which is pretty lengthy. You won't have a ton of lost aperture from that uh, 1.4 teleconverter. And that should be a great go-to, especially if you're pairing it with something like the Alpha 1 or the A7R4, where you have some resolution to crop in further. And uh, my next couple photos actually were shot on the A7R4 and I used that resolution to get closer to the bear versus walking. Excellent, so let's, let, let's see those photos. Yeah, so um, there's one bear photo that everybody really wants and that's like the head on staring into your soul. I wasn't able to get it on this trip but I did get it on my next trip out to the same location and that's this shot right here. Um, so this was shot on the A7R4 with the 600 millimeter F4, and then I cropped in a little bit. So it looks like I am seconds away from being polar bear lunch uh, or guest breakfast. This was very early in the morning, but uh, I actually, I was probably 60 or 70 yards away from the bear uh, when I took it and then cropped in a little bit to, to bring some more drama and uh, yeah, this is a photo I've, I've been dreaming about basically my, my whole life. I've seen photos like this taken by, you know, Tom Mangelson, Charles Glatzer, Paul Nicklin. They like the greats of the industry and they've been just so impactful to me. Uh, I wanted to try and get my own. I acknowledge there's like zero creativity in this trying to like duplicate somebody you look up to's images, but that's sort of the reality of it, right? Sometimes something inspires you so much that you just want to capture one of your own. And this shot was that. And now as a caveat, uh, this bear did actually want to eat us. This is hunting behavior he's displaying. And so I was very glad I had the 600 with me instead of the 400 and a little resolution to play with. This was probably the closest and scariest wildlife encounter I've ever had. This bear, uh, he we saw him about two miles off because again, the flattest place I've ever been in my entire life. So we saw him when he was about two miles away walking towards us and we positioned ourselves in a place where we thought he would just pass by us and we could take some photos as he went by. And uh, the, here, I'm gonna go forward a, a few. So as he started walking by, this is another photo from the same bear, same encounter. He looked over at us and the, uh, the ears forward 
head down, eyes locked on is definitely I'm hungry body language. This bear walked almost a full circle around us trying to position himself downwind and uh, did every single like textbook hunting behavior that you can think of for a polar bear, including sitting and facing away from us. Because again, their number one food source is seals, which no offense to seals. I love them. They're cute, but they're very stupid. And so if the bear isn't looking at them, the seals literally just forget that the bear is there. So the bear tried that with us. Thankfully, we're at least 10% smarter than seals. And so we didn't forget he was there. Uh, he even laid on his back, tried to pretend he was sleeping in the hopes that we would uh, let our guard down. And when all of that failed, he stood up and walked straight towards us and just kind of said, screw it, I'm going to just try to eat you. And uh, we ended up having to take some evasive maneuvers to scare him off, so to speak. Um, you never run away from bears, I should mention, but we we had some noise making rounds in a weapon that are literally just loud and scary. And thankfully that worked uh, and we were able to get out of here with no, no harm, but uh, it was a fascinating experience. I was there with these incredible Arctic guides. So I always felt safe, which is great. I I say I trust them with my life and that could not be less metaphorical. It is 100% literal. I actually put my lives in their hands, as you can see from this bear. And I never once felt actually in danger. Uh, and it was, it was so unbelievably cool to witness a polar bear's stalking and hunting behavior firsthand and have him stare straight down the barrel with my lens while I was pushing the shutter. Uh, I've never had my heart pounding so fast out of excitement before. It was really, really cool. And this uh, to me is without a doubt, one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. Now, one thing while we're on the, the polar bear kind of theme, because I'm, I'm sure we might see some others, you know, other bears make an appearance, but while we're, while we're on the polar bear uh, uh, theme, uh, Clemson, who's joining us on Vimeo wanted to know, how do you adjust exposure to compensate for the bear's white fur? That is a great question. And it's probably the hardest thing about it. Um, the bear's actually slightly yellow, which is interesting. Uh, they do sort of look white, but when you first start editing the images, I actually, I toned down the yellowness a little bit. They're sort of the color of like good butter, which is fascinating. However, the landscape they're in also is white. I mean, it's white snow on white snow with a whitish animal. This kind of showcases the yellowish color of the bear a little bit better. It's it's very difficult. And that's a great question because of that. I always will start by spot metering on the brightest thing I can find. So when we head out to go try and find a bear, I will set my camera settings. If, if it's like a clear sunny day and I can count that the setting, the light isn't going to change much, I'll pick a bright white patch of snow and I'll spot meter about plus one to 1 1.5 on that location so that I know the whites are bright, but they're not blown out like unrecoverable highlights. Um, conversely, on something like a black bear, I'll do the exact opposite. I'll find like a dark stump or a log and I'll spot meter at negative 1.5 so that I know the shadows will be dark and rich, but not crushed beyond saving if I need to make adjustments in post. And you have to sort of just pay attention. I, I always, for every animal I photograph, will get my settings set before I have the encounter to the best of my ability, because you don't want to be fiddling with your aperture or your shutter speed when a bear is staring at you like your lunch. You want to be able to capture the photos, right? The worst thing here would be if I had to adjust my exposure and I accidentally put my shutter speed down to 1 50th and I ended up with a blurry bear. That would be devastating. <laughs> um, so I, uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I'll always, you know, I start with my shutter speed at a minimum of one one thousandth to eliminate as much motion blur as possible. And I kind of work backwards from there, but spot metering on the brightest thing in the area is going to be the best way to go. Wonderful. And just because you brought it up, Judy, Judy wanted to know, and you started talking about it. What photo pro programs do you use in post? Uh, I edit in Adobe Lightroom almost exclusively. Uh, I do a tiny bit of Photoshopping and I do have one Photoshop image to share during this presentation. I hope nobody hates me. Um, but for the most part, uh, Lightroom gets it done. Excellent. We don't hate you, Nate. We, okay. we, we love you still. <laughs> that's, that's always pretty contentious having a, the Photoshop thing. Some people are fully in favor of it. Some people think you're a fraud if you even have it downloaded on your computer. So <laughs> it's a, it's minor amounts of Photoshopping. Hopefully you'll all 
be okay with it. We'll, we'll get there. I, I speak for everyone, Nate. We're okay. Okay, cool. I'm glad we have the voice of the masses here to soothe me. Um, the, so I guess going back to the A7R4, I was talking about having some resolution to play with. This is about as close to a bear as I would ever want to be again, 600 millimeters, but I loved having 62 megapixels because I was able to crop it tight. Um, I know it's a vertical crop. Some people have different opinions on whether or not the, the four by five Instagram crop is cool, but I actually think for this photo, it works the best. And I love that I was able to crop in this far and still have 5,000 pixels on the long end to play with. I can print this photo. I can use it for magazine covers, book covers, whatever, and still have a usable image. Um, and then all of these polar bear photos sort of got me thinking more about like how difficult the Arctic was. This next photo is sort of unrelated to the bears, but it was just sort of a cool capture that I loved. And this really goes back to your white on white, because this was an overcast day with the whitest animal I've ever seen in the whitest conditions with fresh falling snow. Um, truly one of my favorite photographs of an Arctic fox sprinting. Um, I was teaching a workshop up in Churchill for this one. And moments after this, this little fox went to go try and steal food from a mother and cub polar bear. I think this fox had actually like buried some lemmings. They start stockpiling food for the winter. And it, it had buried some lemmings in the snow and these polar bears found it and were eating it. And he went to go try and steal some of his food back. And these two polar bears uh, were chasing it off. And I didn't end up getting the shot because I was, I was helping somebody with some settings, but some of the coolest photos I've ever gotten. And again, a good example of trying to capture the experience of these animals and where they live rather than just like a sexy portrait. And again, this animal at a dead sprint kicking snow up off its feet, the fresh falling snow, I feel like tells more of a story than if it's just standing there staring at you. That's always something I'm gonna try and do with my photos. Even going back to this, I know he's standing and staring at me, but the paw is up. So there's some motion implied. Again, the paw is up, he's walking towards me. It's not just like a standing still, photograph. And uh, again, a good example of spot metering ahead of time, making sure that all of my settings are exactly how I wanted it, is the only reason I was able to capture this. This was shot handheld with the 400 millimeter and not cropped. This is the full frame image out of my camera. And that's because I got my settings set ahead of time. I had everything exactly where I wanted. I knew that an Arctic fox was a high likelihood because we'd seen them running around all day. So I had my shutter speed at, I think, 132 or 3,200th of a second. Very, very fast, wide open so that I could keep my ISO pretty low at f2.8. And because all of that was ready, I had my burst turned on when this fox went sprinting by. All I had to do was lift my lens and follow along. Makes it a lot easier. Um, so this was sort of the end of my Arctic experiences for now. And it took me, uh, I started to realize that really the, like the ultimate truth for wildlife photography, and this is probably the number one takeaway from this is that all good photos are a result of being in the right place at the right time. There's no amount of photography skill that will get you a world-class photo if you never leave your house. You have to just go places that are difficult at the right time for what you're trying to capture. And I, uh, thankfully for me, since I've, I've always just been like a nature person, I'm always outside, but you know, I'm never gonna get an Arctic Fox photo here in Salt Lake City where I live. You have to go to these tough places. And so I started going some to some more remote locations. And this next photo that I think is on my list of my five favorites, is from the Brooks Range in Northern Alaska, Gates of the Arctic National Park. And it is a caribou. Uh, this you can kind of recognize as a little bit like coming full circle from those first images that I shared, uh, or the very first elk photo, right? It's a, an ungulate standing on a, a hilltop with mountains behind it. Now, I wanna go back and forth between the two because I think it's kind of funny just like how dramatically improved the concept is, right? Like, this is okay. I feel like this does a much better job of, of summarizing what I saw and where I was. 
Um, something that's kind of cool and worth noting, this is a member of the porcupine caribou herd, which is the longest land migration on planet Earth. They travel 1,500 miles across the state of Alaska from uh, the, oh, I got to think, the southwest slope for their overwintering all the way up to the northeastern corner of Alaska, which is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for, uh, for giving birth in the spring. Uh, and so it was just immensely impactful to me to get to see one of these animals that's participating in this incredible migration. And I was ridiculously far away. And that's part of what makes this photo so meaningful to me. Uh, this is a national park with no roads into it, no roads inside it, no established hiking trails or campsites. So we had a bush plane fly us in, land directly on the tundra, dropped us off, said, these are your GPS coordinates. I will see you in eight days. I hope you're there. Um, and that experience is part of what makes this so cool. We didn't see a ton of wildlife. We saw this and a couple bears. Uh, the bear encounters in a place like this are not what I would consider photography opportunities. They're more of a de-escalating the situation opportunity. So I didn't get any photos of the bears from there, but I will always love this photo as a way to showcase just like the pure immensity of these wild landscapes by far the most remote place I've ever been. Uh, the next couple of photos I'm going to show just kind of showcase how beautiful this area is. There's no animals in them, but uh, this was where I was camping when I took that caribou photo. Unreal. Uh, another shot of my tent a little further down the valley, I guess, to give some perspective. This mountain right here is this mountain. No, wait, I have that backwards. This mountain. So we rounded the corner down the valley so that the photo or the mountains that are kind of poking up on the upper left here are the ones in this photo, but it's just an unbelievably remote place. Um, I think we were probably the only person in this valley for the entire year of 2019, which is just an unbelievable treat. And uh, we continued to explore the state of Alaska, which is just a wildlife paradise. There are animals all over the place. They're unbelievably cool. If you are a burgeoning wildlife photographer and you're trying to take my advice to heart where you have to go to the right place at the right time, the right place is Alaska and the right time is any time you show up. It's unbelievable. I've been there from February through September and it's always incredible. Even in the dead winter, you're gonna see moose. In the summer, you're gonna see uh, you know, a lot more bears and such, but the bald eagles uh, are everywhere. They're right on the beach, catching fish right in front of you just an example of like anybody who has a camera with a fast shutter speed can take this photo by putting yourself in the right place at the right time. Uh, we just, we found a beach and there's some fishermen tossing, uh, you know, the clean fish guts onto the beach. And so it was just like an hour of exceptional bald eagle photography. Um, I don't name any of my photos, but I named this one Eagle Force One. I don't know why I'm kind of proud of that. It's a stupid joke, but I love it. <laughs> I like it too. I, I wanted I wanted to talk a little bit about, you mentioned, you know, going out into that valley and you mentioned uh, being dropped off and, and giving your coordinates. And it's like, well, hope you get there in time because uh, if, if, if not, I might not be there. But I think, I think something people kind of tend to overlook and maybe discount is we always focus on the gear side of things in terms of camera equipment, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the gear side of things in terms of what you should be venturing out there with uh, to, to be safe and to make sure that you're well protected and you're well prepared, especially when you're going out on something like you were an eight day travel. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most important aspect of that is to do your research on the landscape that you're going to be in ahead of time. Cause my packing list is going to be dramatically different for the northern mountains in Alaska versus if I'm going backpacking in Arizona to have a Supai Falls or something, for example. Um, and so that to me is the most important thing to, to think about. Like I'm not going to carry bear spray and a negative 10 degree sleeping bag in Arizona, um, but I'm also not going to carry five gallons of water through Alaska because there's just much more abundant water sources. But absolutely always come prepared with some sort of like emergency notification device. So uh, I had the Garmin inReach. It's capable of sending satellite text messages. So if we didn't get to those coordinates, I could text the pilot where we were and we could work out a plan. It's not cheap. So it's a last case resort, but always have something like that. Come prepared for any kind of inclement weather, like just 
prepare on it storming on you, no matter where you are, even if they say it's not going to rain for the next month, bring a raincoat, bring a warm jacket just in case you never know. Uh, and then, you know, proper uh, food, water filtration, hiking boots that are comfortable and you trust, don't buy them the day before your trip, make sure you break them in ahead of time. Uh, and again, just, you have to, I don't know if I have time to like really fully get into it, but definitely be prepared for where you're going and think about every location as slightly different. Uh, you know, like if you're photographing black bears in Florida, you're going to approach it differently than photographing Alaskan coastal brown bears in Katmai National Park. Awesome. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. And then speaking of Alaskan coastal brown bears in uh, Lake Clark National Park, uh, on that same Alaska trip, this is the same national park as the bear walking along the shore that ended up on the cover of National Parks magazine. So I finally got back to this park, some more wonderful bear experiences. Um, this kind of just goes back to showcasing personality, right? If you know how to read body language, I feel like this tells a story. Mom is standing squared up, ears forward, shoulders, you know, planted. She's clearly aware of a threat and so is her cub. He looks timid. Uh, and I, I just really like, I'm not showcasing as much of the landscape because their body language to me tells more of the story. And same thing on this photo, which I, I've always loved. She clearly sees me personally as a threat. Uh, she's staring me down, protecting me. He is probably only like two months old. So he's kind of a little doofus and he's not really paying attention to a whole lot. He's uh, just digging for clams, doing whatever, whatever he wants, but she is staring me down. This is a good example of that spot metering I was talking about where these bears aren't as bright, like nothing in this frame is white. So I'm not going to meter for my highlights. I'm going to meter for my shadows. And so I was paying attention to my focus or sorry, my, my exposure on the darker feet, uh, knowing that the lighter colored fur would still be salvageable if I needed to adjust my exposure in that regard. And uh, I like trying to keep these shadows darker so that they're like, they're rich. They're not, you know, lifted. You don't need to see every single detail on the fur on the underside of her back leg, right? Having that contrast, that depth really helps convey a little bit of the landscape you're in. And it brings some more like power to the image, in my opinion. Um, and then this brings us full circle back to the, uh, the last image in my presentation, another elk on the ridge line. Um, and I kind of like starting with the elk and ending with the elk. And this was a great example of the right place at the right time on accident. I had spent the entire day trying to photograph wolves in the Lamar Valley of Yellowstone. So I had the 600 millimeter lens with the 1.4 teleconverter on because they were just, we saw wolves, I guess I should say, all day, uh, about a mile and a half away from us. <laughs> so I had the longest possible lens combination on, um, what is the 600 times 1.4? Is that like 680? Or sorry, like 780 millimeters, something like that. Uh, pretty lengthy lens. Didn't really get anything I liked all day. So disappointed. We were driving back towards uh, our hotel and driving back through, gosh, I don't remember what valley this was. I was in the passenger seat and I looked over and I saw a herd of elk down in a valley and we're like, you know what, let's pull over, let's see what happens. And the moon rose and thankfully being at almost 800 millimeters, any photo of the moon is going to look enormous. It rose right over this hillside and this big bull elk, you can see his track going through the snow. He walked up towards the right side of the frame and he plopped himself on the ridge, maybe 10 feet outside of this frame. And so here is my admission. The tiniest bit of Photoshopping happened here. I scooted the elk a little bit closer to the moon. That's it. It's not fake. I swear. I hope you, got all, you can all forgive me, but I moved the elk just a tad closer to the moon because he kind of walked out of frame. So there was that. But um, this, to me, the epitome of the right place at the right time, completely unintentionally. But it was the result of, again, putting myself out in these scenarios with the intention of trying to take photos. So I was prepared with my gear. I was prepared with some settings 
And we ended up getting lucky, but it, you know, if I was in my house, I never would have gotten this shot. It was the, the point of spending two weeks in Yellowstone looking for animals and uh, really lucky timing that the moon rose right where this elk walked up onto the ridge, just ridiculously lucky. Um, but also like, I like to remind myself that that luck is the result of hard work and preparation. So not pure luck, but you just have to put yourself out in these scenarios and be prepared for whatever might come your way. And that's it. Those are my, uh, my favorite wildlife photos, a little bit of a story. I assume there's probably a bunch of questions we haven't gotten to yet. Awesome. Yeah. So, so everybody, uh, just a reminder, if you have some questions, we do have some time still with Nate. So, uh, get them in while you can. Don't wait till the last minute till Nate's about to run out of here because, uh, then, then you won't get them answered. Uh, <laughs> uh Starth, Starth uh, was joining us on Facebook and actually had a comment for you. Uh, he really appreciated that you used the term animal glamor portrait. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's part of uh, photo critique and, uh, he's going to use that tonight at their wild life photography class. Uh, he said that their instructor, uh, always uses more of glamor. He prefers environmental and, uh, now he's got a better term to explain the differences. So, uh, <laughs> for that, uh, in, in, in talking with, with, uh, you know, all, all of this and talking about animals and, and this is something you and I spoke about kind of in the virtual green room prior. Um, and, uh, and, being that it's World Wildlife Day, I think it's really important to bring up for people who are viewing and, and thinking about these things, you know, how how important is it to make sure we're capturing, you kind of touched on it a little bit and talked about it with old Pete about, you know, the, the, the climate crisis and things like that. How important is it to photograph and capture the animals in their natural climates and put that out there for people to enjoy and understand and appreciate to, to conserve so that we can continue for hopefully thousands of years to enjoy them. Yeah, it's immensely important to me. I would say even borderline uh, the most important thing. Uh, I am a conservationist at heart and that's part of why I went on that semi-aggressive rant. I guess here yeah, I can stop sharing so that people can see my face now. Um, that's part of why I went on that, that quasi-aggressive rant uh, at the beginning of my presentation about never impacting the animals. You never want them to feel your presence. And um, it's as much about like, if I'm taking a photo of an animal and I'm trying to express conservation, like we, I love Yellowstone as another example. It's like, you know, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is one of the most rich biodiverse areas in North America. If I'm up there making these animals' lives worse while trying to take these photos, I am doing the exact opposite. And I wanna do everything I can to continue protecting Yellowstone. I wanna use my photography to encourage expansion of the protected greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I would love to see additional acreage converted to protected wilderness. I'd love to see more national parks. And I wanna use my photography to help encourage legislation uh, sway the public opinion in ways that promote further conservation. But if in doing so, I am actively harming these locations, that to me is beyond hypocritical to just like downright buffoonery, right? So uh, I think it's it should be your ultimate goal as a wildlife or landscape photographer is to not just enjoy these locations responsibly, but then use your work, use your artistry to help encourage others to conserve these beautiful places. Wonderful. Definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, now, going back to a subject we talked about earlier on, we talked about focal length a little bit, and uh, we, we gave specifics of that. Do you, have, do you have a preference when it comes to focal length in terms of, of how you shoot? I mean, obviously, each image is going to be varying upon the circumstances, but is there something that's kind of your go-to where you're like, I'm going to start here. And then from here, I'll either, you know, open up a little bit more or stop down. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really hard to answer because it is situationally dependent, of course. Um, that's part of why I like something like the 100 to 400, because I can go from the, the animal glamour portrait to a wider out environmental portrait with the same lens. I don't have to swap lenses. A lot of the times if I'm on an animal specific shoot, I will actually carry two cameras with two lenses. So 
Uh, for the polar bears, for example, I was carrying an Alpha 1 with the 600 millimeter F4 uh, on one side. And then on the other side, I had the A7 IV with the 70 to 200. And so I'm prepared there for any scenario, right? When the animal's far away, I can use the 600 millimeter to try and get closer. As I approach, I can switch over and zoom out and take a photo at 70 millimeters and capture the landscape. Uh, like I've said a couple times, I guess I try to be a little bit holistic in my approach and get a little bit of both. And so I don't have like a one size fits all focal length for wildlife photography. Now about once a week, I try to debate if I should sell my 400 and buy the 600 instead, but I still own the 400. So I clearly haven't settled that argument with myself yet. <laughs> or, or, or you could just do what we all do and just add the 600 and keep the 400. <laughs> oh gosh. I need to do about 30 more of these presentations before I can afford that lens. <laughs> um, Judy, Judy from YouTube wants to know, uh, first off a, a comment, uh, she says great photos, uh, but wants to know, do you do Yellowstone workshops or, or even for that matter, do you do any workshops? Excellent question. I'm very disappointed in myself that I haven't brought this up yet. I do <laughs> workshops. Yes, absolutely. Um, I did a Yellowstone workshop for three years uh, due to COVID and just increased regulations. I don't have one on the books for this year. Uh, I'm, I would love to get Yellowstone back on my website here shortly, but I do have a wildlife specific photo tour coming up in May. We go out to the San Juan Islands in Washington for foxes. Uh, there's this beautiful nature preserve out there where these beautiful uh, red foxes and a black fox live out there. They have their little pups in the springtime and we spend a couple days. I think there's only one or two slots left for that. So if you'd like to join us, sign up right now. It's just on my website, natelubie.com. Um, you can shoot me an email or an Instagram DM and I can help you find it as well if you need. Awesome. And then speaking of Instagram, how can, how can people find you on Instagram? Is it just Nate Luby? Uh, I am Nate in the wild on the internet. There you go. Nate in the wild, Nate not, in the wild. Not, not in the internet, not on the internet. That's separate. On, that's just, that's the, Oh yeah. Yeah. The webs. yeah. On the internet <laughs> comma. My name is Nate in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now, just, just for clarity. Uh, now Naveen said, and this is a great question and, and, you might hate me for it, but it is great. I love it. Uh, greetings from India. What is the one thing, and that's why it's tough, the one thing you wish you knew when you started taking photos? Um, wow. No, I think that's a really good question. I just don't know if I was prepared for it. <laughs> uh, um, gosh, the one thing. I guess the one thing I wish I knew when I started taking photos was to know your worth. And that's not like a technical pointer, but just I, photography more than a lot of other art forms, I think is easily exploited and readily taken advantage of. And um, I did a lot of projects for very, very cheap or just for free because I was excited to see my photo used somewhere. And uh, you have to just value yourself, right? Like going backpacking for eight days in Alaska in the most remote part of Alaska was exceptionally difficult. It took a, like months of planning. It took a full week out of my life while I was there. It took several thousand dollars in plane rides to get to this location. Uh, and you can't devalue yourself if people want to use those images. Um, I actually just got an email uh, yesterday from a company that wants to use a photo. I took like a week after I bought my first camera, uh, I still had a full-time job. It didn't cost me anything. I took it like 10 minutes from my house, but you still have to know your worth. You have something that these people want. Uh, and you have to like trust yourself as an artist who is paying the bills, even if it's not your full-time income. It, yeah, just, you know, value yourself, respect yourself in your own time. I think, I think that's, that's a great piece of advice and something that's often overlooked and not talked enough about. So I think, see, even though it was an on the spot question, I think that, that was a great answer. Thank um, you. <laughs> Sue, Sue is joining us here on Facebook. Um, to sum it up is, is really appreciative of your stand on uh, environmentalism in photography. Um, wants to know though, how much do you feel the teller converter adds to the 300 millimeter? Is it worth it or can she live without it? Um, I mean, if it's a 2X teleconverter, it adds exactly 300 millimeters. Um, 
I, I guess it's really just if you feel like 300 millimeters isn't enough, the teleconverter is a good way to get a little bit closer. Uh, the conversion works inversely on your aperture, though. So a 2x teleconverter will double your focal length, but it will double your f-stop. So your 2.8 becomes a 5.6. And I've found there is some reduced sharpness as well, which kind of makes sense, right? You're sending the light beams through just that many more layers of glass, more refraction. It's going to reduce the quality a little bit. And so uh, I know that I sort of talked about not loving them but I do use them. I've shown images in this presentation that were taken with the teleconverter. And so, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a mixed bag. I have one with me. If I'm carrying my long lens, I have the teleconverter in my pocket in case I need it. I will always try to revert to not using it if it's possible. Um, and that's kind of just learning your gear a little bit. I know that with the Alpha One or the A7R4, I have enough resolution to crop equivalently. Um, but if I don't feel like I can crop in, then I will use the teleconverter to just get myself that little extra reach. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, Nate, thank you so much for being here, yeah. uh, joining us here on World Wildlife Day. Love what you're doing. Love what you're putting out there. And we appreciate it. I uh, want to give a huge thanks to our sponsors over at Sony as well for getting behind it and uh, also being being a sponsor to Nate and, and, and with us, you know, that's always helpful. It, it brings this great, wonderful content to all the masses. So thanks again to everybody. This has been another edition of the B&H virtual event space. We'll catch you next.